Hello everyone, and welcome back to Age of Noob. Our coverage of the Sultan's Ascent DLC continues, and this time, we're taking a closer look at the Chinese variant civilization, Zhu Xi's legacy. I've upscaled all screenshots as usual, and I'll use some Chinese footage for placeholders. Okay, with that out of the way, let's dive right in and begin with the civilization summary. The teachings of philosopher Zhu Xi reshaped the Chinese civilization. With Zhu Xi's legacy, the Chinese boast a sophisticated administration with superior imperial officials and advanced technologies. The brimming treasury helps to establish powerful dynasties and research a breadth of unique technologies. Recruit palace guards, Zhu Kunus, and Green Adiers early on to protect the empire. Okay, let's take a look at the gameplay now. Zhu Xi's legacy is a technological powerhouse. The early bonuses in the Tang and Song dynasties help the civilization advance faster and build towards a bountiful economic foundation. With a strong industrial framework, they can field vast amounts of dynasty units early in the game. Combined with the palace guard being available in the feudal age, Zhu Xi's legacy can amass great armies of unique units with ease. There are many options for improving the Zhu Xi's legacy's imperial officials with unique upgrades, such as faster movement, higher build times, and improving the supervisability. With imperial officials catapulting Zhu Xi's legacy into the mid-game, the Yuan dynasty synergizes with a strong economy by helping produce more military units. In the Imperial Age, Zhu Xi's legacy offers strategic choices for unit upgrades available via landmarks. The Ming Dynasty improves unique units, making the Zhu Xi's legacy a force to be reckoned with in the late game. Alright, let's look into all four ages first, then I'll provide some more context on what we've covered so far. From Age 1, the Tang Dynasty enables the Zhu Xi's legacy to build cheaper landmarks. They also start the game with an imperial official for fast access to both taxes and the supervisability. In Age 2, Zhu Xi's legacy can build the Meditation Gardens, an economic landmark that generates resources based on what is nearby, but enemy units can disrupt the peace and reduce its income. Constructing both landmarks will unlock the powerful Song Dynasty, which makes all economic buildings cheaper. In Age 3, Zhu Xi's legacy can construct the Mount Lu Academy landmark, which adds food to tax income and includes powerful technologies that improve the imperial official. The Shaolin Monastery opens up production of the Shaolin Monk, a powerful martial arts master capable of enduring even the fiercest of attacks. And finally, in Age 4, Zhu Xi's legacy has access to Zhu Xi's library, a landmark which houses many powerful unique technologies, however, only a few can be chosen to research. The Temple of the Sun landmark has four powerful toggles which globally improve specific units. Something immediately should have struck you as we went over this barrage of information, so let's start from the top. The parent Chinese civilization is already complex as is, so let me draw some parallels here. We now know that Zhu Xi's legacy also begins with the Tang Dynasty. For the Chinese, the Tang Dynasty provides plus 30% line of sight for their scouts, but Zhu Xi's Tang Dynasty is different in that it provides a discount to landmarks instead. In other words, while the dynasty names are the same between these two civilizations, their effects in-game will be different. Of course, Zhu Xi's legacy will also begin with an imperial official as well, so coupling this with a cheaper landmark bonus enables a much more explosive start compared to their parent Chinese civilization. Unlike the Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty is economic for both civilizations. The Chinese receive a 33% boost to their villager production speed as you all know, but Zhu Xi's legacy will receive a discount to all of their economic buildings. For those of you who don't know, economic buildings are basically characterized as anything that is not militaristic. So think of your lumber camps, mining camps, granaries, mills, and yes, farms as well. We can't share the exact discount, but it is a really strong bonus in the early to mid game where wood is essential for a strong boom. The devs were unfortunately a bit too vague about the final two dynasties of Yuan and Ming. As we read before, the Yuan dynasty synergizes with a strong economy by helping produce more military units, so this is a reference of some sort of production boost, possibly resource-wise or speed-wise. It is also mentioned that the Ming dynasty improves unique units, making Zhu Xi's legacy a force to be reckoned with in the late game. Again, how the units are improved isn't mentioned, so it could be something like the current Chinese where units gain an additional percent of HP, or they can be improved in other ways. We'll have to wait until the embargo is lifted before we dive into further details. Great, now that we've covered the dynasties, let's talk about another very important distinction. I'll highlight three important sentences here. The first is, recruit palace guards, Zhukunus, and green adiers early to protect the empire. The second one is, with a strong industrial framework, they can field vast amounts of dynasty units early in the game. 
and the third, combined with the palace guard being available in the feudal age, Zhushi's legacy can amass great armies of unique units with ease. Notice how the language revolves around massing unique dynasty units with an emphasis that it's early on in the game. This timing difference insinuates that the way unique units are trained is different to that of the parent Chinese. Again, the devs haven't been explicit about this, so I cannot comment any further, but you should be able to put two and two together to wrap your head around how some militaristic Chinese struggles may not really apply to Zhushi's legacy. Now that we've covered the main pillars of the civilization, let's get to the fun part and take a look at their unique units. The first is a familiar palace guard, but these soldiers arrive earlier. The palace guard is available in the feudal age for Zhushi's legacy instead of the castle age for the Chinese. This fast infantry unit creates opportunities for early skirmishes. These are the palace guards you all know and love, but as mentioned before, they're available to mass earlier like some other Manitarm civilizations in the game. That said, it is also revealed that Zhushi's legacy has three brand new units that the Chinese do not have access to. The first two are both cavalry units, and they are the Imperial Guard and the Yuan Raider. The Imperial Guard and Yuan Raider become available once Dynastic Protectors is researched at Zhushi's library landmark. Remember, this is the age 4 landmark that allows the research of select few unique technologies. These powerful cavalry units complement the infantry forces of Zhushi's legacy by providing unique characteristics in battle. Unfortunately, no further information was given about either unit, but I believe we can make a few inferences from the screenshot that was released. We can see that the Yuan Raiders and their steeds are lightly armored compared to the mighty and expensive looking Imperial Guards. Based on their looks and the consistency of unit designs in the game, you can make a few assumptions yourself on how each of these two units will be used in the late game. The final unit that was very briefly mentioned were the badass looking Shaolin monks. These units are featured in the civilization's official splash art and can be trained from the Shaolin monastery as mentioned. We can actually extract a lot of information from the publicly released sentence. The Shaolin monastery opens up production of the Shaolin monk, a powerful martial arts master capable of enduring even the fiercest of attacks. And based on this sentence, we know that the Shaolin monk is a religious unit. We also know that it is combat-centric, as they are quote-unquote martial arts masters. And we finally also know that they possess some unique defensive capability to justify them being able to quote, endure even the fiercest of attacks. These units have some very cool looking in-game animations as well, so they also get some style points from myself. To summarize Zhushi's legacy, they are definitely one of the more complex civilizations in the game based on what we know so far, and that's no surprise given the close design philosophy to the Chinese. However, based on my preliminary experience, Zhushi's legacy will still probably feel like a slightly easier version of the Chinese to play and execute for most players, given that surviving the early game is not as painful as their parent civilization. Access to some awesome early eco bonuses, coupled with early access to both the palace guards as well as the imperial officials should make their early game much smoother. That said, given that the landmarks are different, you will also likely have to be more proactive with Zhushi's legacy as passive defensive options may not necessarily work out or even be available like they do with the Chinese. Well, that wraps up everything I can share so far about the new Chinese variant civilization, Zhushi's legacy. Rest assured that we have a busy schedule ahead of us as more news is on the way, so be sure to subscribe to Age of Noob and tune back soon to not miss out on the next announcements the devs will make. Many thanks for our YouTube members for their continued support, and please consider joining as a member as well if you'd like to support me further. Thank you. As always, thanks for watching everyone, let me know what you think of Zhushi's legacy so far, and until next time, Tsai Qian.